preached that Christmas story in Luke chapter 2, start with 8, go all the way to 20. A lot of scripture to read, but it's the Christmas story. I'm reading New King James most to them this week as it's just a mindful reminder of why we're celebrating, why we have all these lights, why we have all this love, why we have presents that's changing. Let's take that moment this week with our families and make sure we recognize that. So I'm going to start in verse 8 today. Around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you, you will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told to them. Amen to the good word of the Lord today. So today as we look at the glorious light that shone that night that broke the sky on that mountainside where these shepherds were a few miles away from the birth of Jesus Christ, we want to look at the light itself. We want to look at the love that came from that light and the love that caused that light to shine. And we want to look at the lost. And really this will be a summary today of kind of where we've gone and over the last four weeks and kind of where we are now and really kind of a launching pad to take us into next year. So let's look at the light first. Let's talk about who God decided to reveal himself to first. So the shepherds by this time in the Jewish culture were looked at as outcasts. They were considered unclean, couldn't go into the temple without ceremony and cleansing. Who's going to watch the sheep while they do that? They were looked at really as the low, the who have thought it's for lack of a better word. Who would have thought that it turned out that way? That's kind of who the shepherds were at this time. They were mostly people were kind of running from the law or problems. They were convicts. They were a rough band of fellas. And the sheep don't tell any secrets. And so they're out there kind of out left in the countryside to themselves because even when they come into town to eat, there are in all of the marketplaces places for shepherds by themselves. Why? Because they smell like <laughs> sheep. And so nobody wants to associate with them. So they kind of keep to themselves. So we see already, just like God has talked about through the prophets, just like with the star, just like with there being no room for him in the end, that if Bethlehem had known the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, Messiah was coming, they would have made room for him. But we see God shining light in the darkest places. We see God reaching and longing and revealing himself to those that have been forgotten, for those that may not even know that they need him, for those that are broken, that are hurting, that have been left. The light has come for all. The light has come for every single one. And that mountainside lit up that night with light. They were afraid, as you and I might be too, right? Think about it. They're sitting around the fire. Oh, Mo and Larry and Curly, they're just sitting around the fire there. Talking about other things they shouldn't be talking about. Messing around, just being shepherds. Talking about how bad each other's been. 
And all of a sudden, an angel of the Lord appears. And says, I got news for you fellas. The Lord has come. Messiah has come. Jesus has come. Emmanuel, God with us, has come. And heaven couldn't contain itself. Not only one angel, but others burst out, made themselves known, and began rejoicing. Glory to God in the highest. Peace on earth and goodwill toward what? All. No doubt I was freaked out too. And the angel said, don't be afraid. I've got good news. The devil always wants us afraid of the light. Because in the light, there's a lot of things like that. That's really. In the light, the truth is exposed. In light, everything that has been hidden in the darkness gets drug out. The light should attract us rather than repel us. But the devil will cause us to be afraid and says, you know, if this gets out in the light, this thing I've tricked you into doing, this thing I've deceived you, this thing I have you bound by, if it gets put in the light, you're not going to be able to be known like you used to be. People will not love you if they know this. But that's a lie. And so when the light comes and we embrace that light, the truth is revealed and everything else is put in perspective. That night, what those shepherds did for a living was put in perspective. That's nothing compared to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. But also who they are were put in perspective. You're not the outcast. You're not the lonely. We do not look to not associate with you. No. We have placed the king in a manger. He's not in royal robes in a palace. He's in swaddling clothes. And he's where they feed the animals. The bread of life has come to be the bread of life for all. The light has come. People who are living in darkness, Isaiah said, and we looked at that word in that sermon, in the shadow of death. People who are in the shadow of death out here today need to see that great light. And that light lives in us. That light lives in me. It lives in you. We must shine the light. Because the light has come, right? The light has come. And therefore, we can shine the light. That night, no doubt, they would have not have felt worthy to go to a palace. They would not have even gone to hear it. They couldn't even go into the temple. But God made himself available. Now think about this. On that hillside, on that mountainside that night, just a few miles from there, no doubt that light show was seen by others, don't you think? No doubt that angel was heard more than just the shepherds, but we only have an account of the shepherds coming. The light is being revealed all the time to those who are living. So we have to know that these shepherds were looking. They decided themselves, let's go if this thing that they have told us is really true, and what I love, the New Living Translation says, they found it just like they said. When the truth comes, when God speaks, you will find him to be just who he is. You will find things to be just like he said. The light will set us free. Amen? Amen. So now let's look at the love. We have the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, lying in a manger. That light has now brought peace because the angels have declared peace on earth and goodwill to men. We talked about that this whole Christmas season, about the peace that the enemy tries to steal from us, especially this time of year, the next three days of Christmas. But he can't have it. I refuse to let him have my peace. And you know the best way that I can get by without having to get upset is to praise Him. Because praise is my way to love God. The angels couldn't contain themselves. They couldn't contain the love of God anymore. They burst out onto that mountainside. They were declaring who God is. They were 
declaring who Jesus is, and they were declaring who he had come for. We should have the love of God in us, the light in us so much that we burst out into praise. That when we are tempted to lose our peace, when we're tempted to not be like Jesus, that we find the love that never fails. That we find the love that can surpass everything else. Because everything in the world is put up against that love. That agape love. For God so loved the world. That he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever would believe in him. Would have everlasting life. You see the life puts things in perspective. It makes the devil afraid. Because once we feel that love. Once we step into that love. Everything else is put in its proper place. They said, the angels, that you will find the babe in a manger, wrapped in swaddling cloths, is what the original thing, we always say clothes. And I read something this week, and I can't validate it, but it's an interesting thing to think about, that those cloths may have been from Joseph's burial clothes, because when you traveled, you had uh, a piece of clothing that you traveled with in case you died along the way that they could bury you in some type of mesh or cloth. And there's no way to make sure. There's a way that that word could mean that, swaddling. But nobody can verify that. But it's something to think about, isn't it? God already foreshadowed what is to come. But what I can make sure that you know is that we know from those claws, because they were narrow strips about four inches wide, probably about six foot long, that Jesus was wrapped in blood. Mary loved them. She cared for them. Most likely she had some salt she carried with her because they would wrap these babies, they would rub them in salt and then wrap them close, and they would bind them up this way so they wouldn't scratch themselves so that they would be swallowed. They still do that in the hospital sometimes. I could never wrap Hunter the way they wrapped him after we got done. But it's amazing how tight, because they don't want him to scratch themselves, they are vulnerable. Think about the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords loving us enough to become that vulnerable before us. To just be a baby. And these Shepherds now know that this baby is not just thrown away in this manger, but because he is wrapped in these swaddling claws, that he is loved. And he desires to be loved by us. He loves us so much that he gave himself for us. But this was not the only time that Jesus' body was wrapped. It was wrapped for his burial. They bound him again. They put myrrh on him. They put spices on him. They wrapped him up in blood. Why? Because he gave his life for us. Yet again, showing from the manger to the cross. Without that, we have nothing. But because of that, We have the greatest gift of all. Because he didn't stay bound in those clothes. We're not going to Easter yet, but let me just share a little bit about Easter with you. On that day, when Peter and John ran to the tomb, John was a little freaked out. He kind of stood here, took the man on in. Peter found the face, the headdress, folded up in English. It is. And because it is, because it is, the love that he had on that cross now lives in you. Lives in you. And that love desires to grow. There's a seed there. We just need to water it. How do we water it? Through praise. How do we water it? Through worship. How do we water it? Through obedience. Through sacrifice, through faith, hope, and love. It just begins to burst from us and the glorious light shines. Because Jesus has come, he has died, he has rose again, and Emmanuel 
God with us is in us in the person of the Holy Spirit. He's just as real, if not more, and I'm looking at you and you. It's amazing how much He wants to speak to us, how much He wants to guide us and direct us and tell us. And that's hard to think about on a Monday morning when all these things come crashing back in, but that doesn't make it any less true. The truth is that God so loved you that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. There's nowhere that love can reach. There's nowhere that love is not willing to go. There's nowhere that love will not find in our hearts. And there's nothing that love can do. He deserves our praise. The angels burst out that night for something that didn't have anything to do. I say all the time that we can sing a song that they can't sing. As angelic as their voices are, and as horrible as mine is, some of you heard that Sunday night, didn't you? I can sing a song they can't sing. That God has redeemed Merry, Merry, Merry Christmas to me. Amen. Amen. Now let's look at the lost. The light came, not to those who were found, Jesus said. Those who are well don't need a doctor. But the light came for those who are lost. For those that think there is no way. For those that think I've blown. For those that think I've missed it. For those that think I am not worthy. For those that need him, he can. He's always looking for those that need him. It's those that don't need him that we need to pray for them or don't think they need him. They need him. But you and I, once we receive salvation, once we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, we tend to forget about those who are lost. I think about the ten lepers this morning that were in Israel, and Israel is bound by seizure. There's an army taking them over, and they are starving to death. And these guys said, we're going to go turn ourselves into the enemy. At least there we'll be fed or we'll be killed. Either way, our suffering will end. And God went in in the middle of the night before they got there and caused that army to leave in a panic. They left so quickly that they left everything, horses, supplies, everything. And those leprous men got there and they began to put on clothes that they would have never worn. They began to eat food that they had not had in months or years. Probably some delicacies that they had never had the privilege to do it. They were enjoying themselves going, I can't believe this is happening. And then one of them said, this isn't right. We've got to go back and tell the whole the country of Jerusalem what God has done. Sometimes we get so caught up in our own bubble as Christians, we forget about what God has done. We forget about saying, this isn't right. I've got to go tell. I've got to go shine my light. The light's come to the forgotten, just like these shepherds. The lowly, those that won't even be associated with to eat, where there seemed to be no way, God made a glorious way. We've never visited the palace but he was in a manger, not wrapped in royal robes, but strips of blood. And this is what I want you to hear today. I'm about to wrap up in just a moment. But this is where we are. This is what this group God wants to share with you. You're listening in today, welcome. God wants to share this with us. If you know him today, you know Jesus as your Savior. The truth is, even then, we get lost we lose our way. We get confused. I hear the murmurings out there. It's true. The pastor does too. Sometimes I'm like, I'm not sure, Lord. I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do right now. And I'm definitely not sure what you are doing. I'm trying to figure it out. I'm going to trust you through it. But sometimes we just get off. I was talking to a young man this week who was talking about ministry in general and different things. And I said, it's so easy to get caught up in the work of the Lord 
and lose your relationship with the Lord. It's so easy to get caught up in just the busyness of the world and forget our personal relationship. That God has this table set for us every day. That His light shines for us to partake of every day. That everything we need is in God. But sometimes we just lose sight of that. Sometimes we get caught up and the enemy is so relentless. There's thousands of ways that he is so conniving. He's so sneaky. Sometimes he hits us head on. He believes that he's confident enough that he can blow us and sustain a blow that will cause us not to get back up. Those are easier to me to handle than the blows that come from behind, that stab me in the back, that undercut me. Those are the hardest. But when we get lost, we just go back to our roots. Because this week, I was asked the Lord this question. I said, Lord, I know about the shepherds. I know that they were lowly. I know that they were forgotten and you revealed yourself to them. I was just out cutting grass. I see, it's amazing how much when that motor's running and that grass is flying. It wasn't because it wasn't grass that's coming through that. I was just talking to him to myself and I said, I know there's something else here because your word's so deep. And I know you want me to share something because I just felt it. I said, what, what is it? Lord? I, I want to know what you're trying to share to me. And he said, every time my children get lost, I take them back to the roots. And I said, so what does that mean? And he began to lay it out for me. Abraham left his land didn't know anybody. Didn't know anything. Didn't know where he was going. But God led him somewhere. And God said, this is your land. As far as you can see. And your descendants, Abraham, they're going to outnumber the sands of the seashore. Abraham never got to see that. Abraham got frustrated when he got lost. And he tried to fix it himself. Because his wife Sarah was barren. And they had just didn't believe God could do that. And so, Hagar came in, her concubine. And Ishmael was born. And we're dealing with Ishmael still today. Ishmael is mad and angry. Feels not validated. God prophesied that he would kick like a donkey and fight his brothers until he comes and said things right. But God didn't Give up on Abraham. He just took him back to his roots. And Isaac was born. Now this is what God said to him. What was Isaac? What did Joseph say? When they were bringing them in and Joseph, his son, saved him in Egypt, he said they're shepherds. And Egypt found shepherds who tested them. But the very testing part that Egypt found they were settling in the land that God had for them the whole time. But we all know that another Pharaoh was born, the Bible says, that didn't know anything of Joseph and all of his ways and all the great things he had done for Egypt, and they became slaves. Israel had lost their way. Everyone was doing what they thought was best. But God took them right back to the roots. Even their leader lost his way. He had a passion to want to delivered his people, but he killed an Egyptian past master in the process. And the next day he comes and talks to two of his brethren that are fighting each other, and he says, you guys should be doing this. We should be seeking the Lord. And they say, well, you will kill us like the Egyptian. You did yesterday. And so he ran to the desert. Lost. You know what he did in the desert? He was a shepherd. I back to the and then he came and led the children of Israel out. The greatest shepherd of all Moses, other than the shepherd of all shepherds. But then they lose their way again. Read the Bible. They get lost. How does he get them back on sin? They want a king. Their king was a counterfeit. Didn't work the way they thought it would work. But who did God call? Shepherd. Out from in the flock. And God said, in this life, I will work the Messiah. And then came the shepherd, the good shepherd, the shepherd of all shepherds. He always takes them back to the roots. See, 
They had decided that the shepherds and I, that's, that's, we're above that now. We're blessed. Yeah, they're blessed. They're bound by the Roman Empire. Yeah, they're blessed. But yet they want to look down on each other. Sound familiar? Amen. I shared with you last week. What we have is real. The Holy Spirit that lives in us is real. The way God's called us to live is different from the world. And it will be odd to them. But it is not such a class. And the Holy Ghost that lives in me is not to be looked at. There's nothing to be ashamed of. And we've got to get back to the roots. We have to get back to the roots. So what's the roots for us? Well, Jesus was not only a shepherd, but he was a prophet. He came not only to cover and lead and save us, but to build a bridge back to the world. What is that bridge? The cross. So when we get lost and we lose our way, what are our roots? Our roots are the cross. Go back, Neil. Return to your first love. Let him set you ablaze. Let the fire burn bright. Oh, come. Oh, you faithful. Come to the cross of worship. As you begin to worship, the light begins to grow, the fire begins to burn, and all of a sudden you are a beacon not only for yourself, but for the host. So today, as the praise team comes again, I want us to just think about something for a moment. When we take time this week to worship, hopefully, you'll do what I did recently, which was just sit in the house with every light off with the Christmas trees. Just sit in that light, drink some coffee that's stronger than most of you would drink. And just think about the world. Think about the world. In the wee hours of this morning, as Teresa had this vision and it came to pass, I just paused for a moment, shut all these lights off. And that on, I said, oh, hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lord. Christmas is about joy. Joy unspeakable. We could may endure for a night, but joy always comes in the morning. Thank you, Lord, for your son. Thank you that he came as a baby, vulnerable, wrapped in love, Gave his life crucified by God's own creation. But yet wrapped in love again. And I determined to wrap it in love today. I determined to worship him. So when you look this week at the lights, take a moment. Take a moment to worship. Really let yourself go. Let your heart be open before him. Be vulnerable before him. Let the light embrace you. Because here's what happens. When we do that, we glorify God. God is glorified when we get back to the basics. Every time we resist the lightest temptation, God is glorified. Think about that. Every time we obey His Word, He's glorified. Every time we worship Him, He is glorified. Every time we overcome something that the enemy placed before us, we glorify God. Every time we face another day, and we get up and say, Your will be done. We glorify God. When we tell each other Merry Christmas, we glorify God. You can think of so many things. When we speak His name, Jesus, we glorify God. I want to glorify God. As we head into this year, 2020, and I won't be cheesy with you and say we got perfect vision in 2020. I didn't think about it. You know how I am. But I do want to glorify God. And I do want us to get back to the basics. And I'm going to leave us there. I hope you'll follow. I hope you'll get your facades dug dealt with. I hope you'll release your heart. And I hope you'll see the night. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? 
We've got to tell the world the light is gone. Make sure the light is living in you today. Let your heart be open right now this morning. There's somebody here that's away from him. Come on, help him. He's standing at the portals of heaven with his arms wide open. He gave his life for me. He gave his life for you. If you don't know him in the way I'm talking about, embrace that this morning. Say, Jesus, I'll make you Lord of my life. I'm tired of just you partnering with me. I want you to lead me. That's the next step in discipleship. That's the next step in victory. That's the next step in becoming the life. I pray you make those decisions today. If you need me to walk that through with you, I'm here at we worship for a few moments. Come and pray with me in the altar. We'll make sure today that you have the blessed assurance that Jesus is your Lord. You can leave here today knowing the life is in you. I pray that we all take a few moments this morning. It's not 12 yet, but we just take a few moments and open our hearts. And we do adore Him today. We do worship Him the way He deserves. He is so worthy of our praise. Let's get back to the roots. Let's remember the cross. Let's step into the light. In Jesus' name. <laughs>
embrace the life today. We say yes and amen to your will and to your way. Father, I look forward to what you will do. In us, through us, around us. Lord, may we be mindful now more than ever that you're with us, that you'll never leave us nor forsake us. That every heart in this place would be light, that you would destroy those things that hold us bound, that you would overcome our pride, that we would really be vulnerable before you, that we submit that we cannot do it without you. Lord, may we need you before you put us in a position that we have to need you. May we walk in paths of righteousness for your name's sake. May your word be light unto us. May it light our path. May it light our hearts. May it light our homes. May it light this church. May it be a city on a hill that cannot be covered so that we can bring revival to this place. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let us rejoice for the light has come. Oh, glorious light. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his countless rest upon you. May you be go from this place today full of his life, love, and grace. Merry Christmas. I love you. The best is yet to come. Amen.